wouldn't really call myself a political scientist as such. In fact, actually, I would say I'm rather homeless because we were moving away from uh, between sociology and political science, uh, a little bit of area studies, Middle East and that sort of stuff. But hopefully, we'll try to continue, give you a much broader uh, overview, uh, considering that contradictions in terms of the approaches of, of the situation in Iran, especially when it comes to the relationship between media <coughs> and state. And, 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 and politics. Uh, but talking about Iran uh, in particular and talking about those issues, I think presents a rather significant dilemma uh, depending how you approach it. If you're a student of the uh, Middle East as such and studying that and historically being the case, it's really, really, really difficult to uh, try to continue to move away from the idea of Islam. Historically, any discussions of the region has always focused and revolved around the so-called essence of, of, of places uh, which are linked to do with Islam. Uh, add to that oil to some extent and debate and uh, discussions about gender. Those are the kind of you know, holy trinity of the discussion. In recent years, only in recent years, Al Jazeera was added to the mix plus. Uh, in recent times, in the last couple of years, the idea of the social media and so on and so forth. So it's, it's really important to remember that it's much broader than that. We also find it historically difficult to go beyond the idea of the authoritarian, repressive, a strong states as such. That is not to deny or to say actually there are no authoritarian states, which I'm going to come back to that later, but to suggest that simple focus on the question of a state always has been done at the neglect or at the expense of social movements, uh, possibility of resistance and possibility of contradictions within those spaces that are generally unified, uh, uh, debated in terms of the Middle East. Also, if you are a student of politics, if you are approaching the idea and the topic from that angle, then you would find it rather completely difficult to go away or move away from that distinction between or completely with conflation of repressive states with hegemonic states. Even in cases where there are some level of consensus, some level of uh, hegemony, there is always uh, the possible physical force in, in, in most cases. So in, in the case of the Middle East, you have the combination of uh, both of them, and that is certainly true. It was true until uh, decades ago in the case of Iran, uh, that there was a combination of consensus plus uh, physical suppression. Also, the focus on politics in the region uh, and in Iran in particular, tends to always focus on the key political actors. It's always about the government, it's always about the state, it's always about significant institutions, again, rather than civil societies, rather than NGOs, rather than activists, and so on and so forth. So again, that's something perhaps it's important to bear in mind. If you are approaching the region and the Middle East, uh, and Iran also, as part of that, as a student of communication and media, you will find it rather and increasingly difficult to again try to get yourself out of the trap of technological determinism. The idea that you had a region very rigid, very restrictive, very repressive, nothing happened, no movements, no resistance, no possibility of engagement, no debates and no discussion, and suddenly, voila, you have the internet and the whole kind of in a way a political landscape begins to change. There is a really significant lack of historical uh, attention when it comes to, to the debating about the internet. <coughs> On the other side, and again related to the question of actual technology, that everything that comes and associated with the internet suddenly becomes political. Everything is good, everything is engaging, everything is participating, everything is interesting. We know for a fact that actually from our own experience in Europe, uh, that internet is also the domain of the fascist and the neo, neo nazis as much as the kind of you know, progressive radical politics. It is not that different in the region, it's not that exceptional. So in many ways, it's not always the domain of everything being completely and significantly political. Obviously, there is a problem in the Middle East which is always confronting us. If you are living in a society in which actually even as a, as a man and woman, you will find it difficult to hold hands while walking in the parks. Even the idea of actually that little emotional engagement becomes a political act in itself. So there is always a problem of actually everything suddenly becoming political, even actually playing games, even kind of spraying water at each other, even actually celebrating New Year in Iran 
and some of the places can become an act of political uh, resistance. But nevertheless, we have to remember not everything in that sense is, is political, not everything associated with internet can be regarded as, as, as political. The reason I mention those, I think because it's important for us to have a better idea of the significant dilemmas and the problems that we are facing when we're discussing Iran. How many of you looking at the question of Iranian situation in the Middle East as a well? whole? Anybody's engaging and writing about that at the moment? Just one? Anybody else interested in? Okay, maybe you might become interested after that. Uh, the reason actually I'm suggesting because there is a whole batch of range of contradictions in play when we're looking at the questions of uh, Iran and in particular the Iranian states, if you are interested in that. It is 35 years since the Iranian revolution and five years since uh, the uprising which was labeled or was known as the Green Revolutions. In all that time, the idea of what is exactly or the nature of the Iranian states has remained a very, very contentious, problematic issue. How would you define Iranian states? In which category, in which pigeonholes, in which sections, under what label would you consider Iranian state to, 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 to fall or, or, to, or to be listed? The issue is, and in reality, here you have an estate which is definitely emerged as part of a really, really significant revolution, one of the last revolutions of the 20th century. So I remember it happened in 1979 at the same time as Sandinista in a uh, revolution in, in, in Nicaragua and then later we had the collapse of the communism in 1989 and development revolutions. But it's one of the most significant revolutions of the uh, last century, uh, 20th century. But there was always from the very beginning a distinct difference between the revolution itself and uh, the state that came out of it. The revolution without that had a very, very significant emancipatory potential. It was a revolt against dictatorship that was very close, associated, closely associated with the United States at that time. But the state which came out of that, not necessarily democratic, not necessarily emancipatory in any sense that you can imagine. So it's important to, to bear in mind that contradiction from the very, very, very beginning. As a result of that, what they had tried to do, what they said that came out of that revolution, has tried to do was to come to with form and shape Iran and Iranian states and Iranian society according to what they regarded to be the basic significant ideas of Islamic State. And not just the state, but also the society, the media, as well as political and social sciences. Uh, all that talk about Kantinui, Islamic or Iranian style of the human rights, Iranian polity, Iranian or Islamic forms of communication and media, Islamic internet, uh, a year and a half ago, Iran was debating uh, the possibility of what they refer to as halal internet. So there have been this kind of thing with constant uh, pressure and attempt to try to remold the society in the image of Islam or what is considered to be the true image of Islam. That's something perhaps we can come back to it later. But if you are running a modern country and trying to kind of in a way really link or trying to run, or trying to remodel the society according to something which was written perhaps 40, 50, 60, 70 centuries ago and had no correlation or direct relationship with a modern life, especially in a country which is sitting on a vast resources of, of oil and, and, and gas and so on and so forth. Without a doubt, you're always in danger of not just Islamicizing, but also Islamicizing and sociologizing Islam in itself. Uh, let me say why I mean by that. It's the problems and the dilemmas which is confronting every single state in the region that tries to basically represent and remodel itself as an Islamic state, or you might actually take any kind of new ideological definitions of that. And as a result of that, you're bound to come up with a number of fascinating paradoxes, by paradoxes when you look at the case of Iran. Islamic State, what is produced, and if you look at the Iranian constitution which is available online and it can be read in English, uh, offers you a very, very contradictory uh, polity and direction. Here you have a system which is, at the heart of it has the idea of the supreme leader, the arbiter and the main uh, interpreter of the key actions and the key uh, trends and the key ideas of the societies. 
but within the same within the same constitution, within the same polity, you have the idea of the separation of the powers. So you have the judiciary, you have the executive, and you have the legislative. You have the idea of the presidency and republic, which, which in itself also alien, perhaps, according to, to those criteria, to the, to the, to the Islamic law and Islamic Sharia. You have uh, organizations and institutions which are subject to periodical sanctions and, and, and elections every four years, every five years, the local councils, the presidency, the parliaments, and so on and so forth. So in a way, you have a kind of, in a way, com combination of contradictory trends and, and processes in, in, in that society. Also, the state that emerged out of the 1979 revolution claimed to be international and cosmopolitan to its very core. It wasn't just supposed to be something to do with that specific <coughs> geographical location that we refer to as Iran, it was an Islamic state that as such did identify itself not only with the non-allied uh, League of Nations, the so-called third world countries, but specifically with the Islamic countries across the globe. A kind of in a way, very specific, unique, uh, perhaps a strange sense of country where cosmopolitanism was there from the very beginning. But this state also has been extremely uh, nationalists in many ways, not just in the case of, let's say, uh, atomic energy, which is constantly being debated and so on and so forth, but even at the core of its activities. Remember the war between Iran and Iraq? Uh, remember, uh, for example, that in, in, in the case of Iran, it's not just enough to be a Muslim in order to be elected a president. Yes? You can't just be that. You can't just be an Iranian. You have to be an Iranian Shia in order to be elected as an Iranian president. So, Iranians is very, very important. I remember back in 1980s when we had the first uh, presidential election. Uh, I was a teenager back then. Uh, there was this really significant figure called Jalaluddin Farsi, who was one of the country with key allies and close associate of, of Khomeini, the leader of the Islamic uh, Republic, uh, in his first day. And he was a candidate, but he was rejected, not on the basis that he wasn't a proper Muslim, but he wasn't a good Muslim. Basically, because he was, his dad was of Afghani origin. It didn't matter that he was actually born and bred in Iran. His dad was of Afghani origin, and as such, was not uh, deemed as a company appropriate person to become the Iranian president. So he was rejected, despite the fact that he was very close. The state also took a great deal of uh, so called, you could argue, social democratic principles in terms of, kind of the way decreasing the gap uh, between the rich and the poor. It claimed to be the uh, basically supporters of the dispossessed, or as they put it initially in the first uh, decade of the Islamic Republic, the so-called uh, poverty or, or barefooted people. <coughs> but historically, what had actually happened, the more we have um, gone forward, the more aggressive neoliberal economic policies have been introduced. So the gap between the rich and the poor has increased uh, beyond any kind of imagination. More privatization. Uh, a decade ago, they finally uh, <coughs> got rid of Article 44 of Iranian constitutions, which made the key sectors of the economy, or put these uh, key sectors of the economy into the hand of the state, and many of the uh, factories, institutions, <coughs> and financial centers have been privatized accordingly. Well, rather, not privatized, but actually given to pretty much like in the Russian situation, you just give it to the, to the closest people to, the, to their state rather than privatization as we know it historically. The other significant dilemma and contradiction certainly has to do with gender. It's impossible not to talk about Islam, not to talk about the Middle East, and not to imagine the problems and the dilemma that is associated with women's life in private as well as in public. The reality is, at some level, and historically, even actually speaking, I remember the first time, I mean, historically, we not, I don't remember, but historically, it's been recorded that one of the key eras in which Khomeini uh, clashed with the, with the previous regime was back in 1963, when the previous regime finally, kind of in a way, uh, allowed women to vote, despite the fact that actually that right to vote didn't really mean that much back in those days. Uh, but Khomeini objected to that right in principle, saying it's against Islamic principles. In 1979, women were a significant part of the Iranian uprising against the Pahlavi dictatorship, and they came to the streets. They were significantly were important. Again, if you go back and if you look at the images and the pictures from that uh, that period, you will see that. 
So how many actually have no uh, other way except suggesting that women have to be in public life. They have to be present in public life. They have contributed significantly to the revolution and as such should remain in the public domain. So since then, this country will continue to battle uh, and the struggle has been going between the Iranian states and Iranian women in terms of the hijab, in terms of the right, in terms of the access to education. So, I mean, uh, as we speak, more than 60% of Iranian undergraduates and postgraduates in Iran are, are, are women. Uh, there are significant, despite all the discriminations, they have managed to challenge a state on every single level on a daily basis in the streets, in universities, and so on and so forth. I think the reason I mentioned those four areas of paradoxes is to understand that we are dealing with a very, very, very complex set of political situations and historical evolution. You might say, okay, that's fine, that's of paradoxes. What do they have to do with the media? In what way that is connected? How does that translate and reproduces itself in the domain of the cultural production <coughs> and, and the media in particular? Well, considering that, the Iranian state has been regarded again and again and again by the Reporters of San Frontier, by human rights organizations, by various NGOs and journalists and media and so on and so forth as one of the most repressive states when it comes to the media and being one of the key enemies and the main enemies of the internet, of the press freedom, of the freedom of the speech and so on and so forth. I think it's again important to realize what processes are taking place now. The first significant Thing to remember is actually massive expansions, despite all those restrictions, massive expansions of the media has taken place in Iran since 1979. Just to give you one ex uh, a number of examples. In the case of the press, between 1979 and 1993, there were more than 2,200 titles uh, that were published in Iran. Compare that, that 13 years, with the over half a century of the period between 1925 to 1979, in which uh, around 4,800 uh, 4, uh, publications were produced. Also bear in mind that in part of that 13 years, we had the war with Iraq, and a really massive period of conflict with bloody suppression of, of, of oppositions in Iran in the 1980s. Uh, but nevertheless, a significant expansion when it comes to the printing uh, culture and, and print media. In the case of the television, back in the 1979, you had two television channels, and effectively, uh, one in many of the regions, if you were living in the west or in the north or, or some part of the south, you only actually had a main uh, national station. In China and other places, you could actually get two. Uh, now, there are six national channels. Add to that uh, a wide range of uh, international activities, uh, which includes Al Alam television uh, established and launched. Uh, in 2003, when the invasion of Iraq began, in, as a way to continue, counteract the, the uh, US media initiatives there. You have the press TV broadcasting in English. You have 